Hello, and welcome to the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Grand Round Series. Uh, my name is Joe Saramelli, and I oversee Grand Rounds for our department. Uh, today is the, the final presentation in the 2020-2021 uh, Grand Round Series in our department. And over the course of this academic year, which is our first year in uh, having it in this webinar format, we've had presentations covering a, a series of domains. Uh, we're in the process now of, of scheduling uh, for next academic year. I encourage you to, to write to me if you have ideas for a specific topic, uh, clinical area to focus on, or even with for a specific speaker. I'm open to hearing uh, from people about, about ideas. Uh, also for today, uh, please write questions or comments into the question box or, or, or um, chat box, and I'll be sure to go through questions and comments um, at the end. Uh, with Dr. Liu. Uh, so for today, uh, our, our presenter uh, is Dr. Francis Liu. And Dr. Liu is the Luke and Grace Kim Professor in Cultural Psychiatry uh, and is Emeritus at the University of California, Davis. Uh, Dr. Liu is a Distinguished Life Fellow of the American Psychiatric Association uh, and has contributed to uh, areas of cultural psychiatry, including the interface with religion, and spirituality, psychiatric education, diversity and inclusion, mental health equity, and psychiatry and film. Uh, Dr. Liu has received several notable awards, uh, including uh, the Special Presidential Commendation in 2002 and 2016 uh, from the American Psychiatric Association and the Distinguished Service Award uh, from the APA. Um, in 2021, the American College of Psychiatrists awarded Dr. Liu the Distinguished uh, Service Award as well. Today, uh, we have the opportunity to hear Dr. Liu describe uh, uh, the cultural formulation and cultural formulation interview uh, and the DSM-5 outline. Uh, and I'll, I'll stop there for now uh, and turn it over to uh, Dr. Liu. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Um, today, I'll be talking about uh, two tools for culturally competent care that are in DSM-5. And to deepen your understanding and uh, use of them to optimize your differential diagnosis and your treatment plan with every patient, I have uh, no disclosures. And my email address is listed here. By the way, a uh, handout packet with the uh, PDF of the uh, slides um, are in a packet that was uh, distributed along with a DEIA resource list. So feel free to contact me uh, afterwards if you have any questions. Our learning objectives today are to uh, learn about the uh, the outline for cultural formulation and the cultural formulation interview, as well as the 12 supplementary modules of the cultural formulation interview. I'll preface my talk with a definition of cultural competence and why is it important, looking at quality of care and training issues. And then we'll go over a roadmap of where culture appears in DSM-5, uh, looking at our tools, I'll highlight changes from DSM-4 to DSM-5. And I also want to make mention that APA is in final preparation for the DSM-5 text revision, um, which uh, will maintain the diagnostic criteria, but the narrative sections, including sections that I'll be talking about, will be updated and revised. So the Joint Commission that accredits healthcare organizations in 2010 adopted this definition of cultural competence that goes back uh, to, the, uh, to uh, 2003. The ability of healthcare providers and healthcare organizations, both individual clinicians and systems of care, to understand and respond effectively, and there are 
Very important to note two verbs there. Understand is one thing, respond effectively is another. To the culture and language needs, and language is made explicit there for its importance in communication, brought by the patient to the healthcare encounter. So again, an everyday occurrence. And this is my uh, one slide amplification of this. I see uh, five essential elements, like different parts of the elephant, if you will, of this journey, uh, a continual learning experience. It has to start with your own self-assessment about your own cultural identity, values, prejudices, and biases. Then the attitude of cultural humility about the limits of your assessment, treatment, knowledge, and skills. And this is summarized in a motto that I'll mention throughout my talk of ask, don't assume, ask, don't assume. Then the attitude of valuing diversity, that it can make a difference in care and ensuring safety about the power dynamics between the clinician and the patient. And finally, how are we going to respond to cultural diversity by adapting our assessment and treatment? And that's what these two tools are here to help us with. Now I'm just going to review uh, quickly four landmark reports going back 20 years now that kind of provide the kind of constitutional basis for cultural competence, starting with this uh, uh, Institute of Medicine report, now the National Academy of Medicine, looking at our uh, dysfunctional healthcare system. They enunciated six quality outcomes as goals. Uh, one of these being patient-centered care that is respectful of and responsive to. So you can see the, the two uh, verbs there individual patient preferences needs values. And so this is aligned with culturally and linguistically competent care. And then equitable care that does not vary in quality because of cultural identity variables. Now this is aligned with the concept of reducing or eliminating disparities in care. And the key word in this uh, definition is quality. It doesn't say providing care that does not vary because of cultural identity variables. I would argue that, in fact, it's essential to incorporate an understanding of these uh, cultural issues in order to provide uh, equitable quality care. Because sometimes when we uh, talk about cultural competence, uh, uh, the response might be, well, you know, I treat all my patients the same, as if that means I'm providing quality care for everybody equally. But that's, it's not as simple as that. So the next report that came out a year later from the Institute of Medicine uh, demonstrated for the first time that racial ethnic minorities received lower quality health care, even for controlling with a, for a number of different variables. And they looked at both system-wide uh, cultural competence factors, but also clinical encounter factors. And they put forth biases and prejudices, stereotyping, and clinical uncertainty. And so stereotyping is a very big risk in this uh, discussion because sometimes clinicians read a chapter in a book on how to work with uh, Chinese patients or Asian patients, and then they feel like, well, I, I know this material and I will just simply apply this to every Asian patient I see. Well, that might appear to be cultural competence, but in fact, could be could lead to stereotyping because the cultural identity of the person in front of you is more is most likely more complex than just focusing on one's uh, race or ethnicity. And when we speak about biases and prejudices, of course, there are the intended conscious and explicit biases, but then there are the unintended, unconscious and implicit biases. So if you will Google implicit bias Harvard, you'll come to a very famous test and a website that describes this phenomenon where you can learn more about it. And of course, these biases can be related to a number of cultural identity 
uh, variables as you see here. And for any particular person, they may experience several of these depending on their cultural identity. Uh, they're not uh, siloed necessarily. And the causes of these biases uh, range everything from one's personal, the clinician's personal upbringing and perspectives to uh, living in America. So for example, uh, the bias against immigrants and refugees uh, has goes back to the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And um, these uh, historical biases or slavery um, go back and, and affect us still now. Um, also, our professions had particular understanding of people. The American Psychiatric Association issued an apology uh, in January for certain racist ideas that pervaded American psychiatry. And of course, uh, we all know that homosexuality was uh, diagnosed as a mental disorder until 1973 in the DSM. And the bias against religion and spirituality uh, pervaded much of the last century. The third report uh, focuses on mental health. This is the very famous uh, Surgeon General's report on mental health, culture, race, and ethnicity, David Satcher, uh, who, which documented again for the very first time that racial and ethnic minorities received poor quality health care. And I remember very uh, distinctively that uh, David Satcher came to the APA components meeting on September 8th, 2001, three days before 9-11, to talk uh, with the APA about this, about his report. And President uh, Richard Harding immediately afterwards said to, that he would convene a task force to help um, roll out a strategic plan on how to implement recommendations. And the last report is a follow-up report by Pedro Ruiz, uh, past president of APA, and Anel Prim uh, from the uh, APA uh, deputy medical director, which has chapters not only on racial ethnic minorities and disparities, but also related to other cultural identity categories, diagnoses, and places of treatment. Now, moving on to training, I just want to mention four uh, accreditation standards for psychiatry residency training programs, which focus on competencies that residents are expected to demonstrate during their training. So we have this one about uh, demonstrating competence in the evaluation treatment of patients from different cultural backgrounds. And what underlies that? What underlies that? Well, an obvious one is the ability to forge a therapeutic alliance with such patients. Now, what, what, what might be a part of underlying that? Well, then we have the cultural elements of the relationship between the resident and the patient, including dynamics of differences in identity, values, preferences, and power. So this is very much aligned with section four of the outline for cultural formulation and is really very, uh, very, very important. And the final uh, competence is the area of professionalism, again, uh, residents are expected to demonstrate sensitivity and responsiveness to a diverse patient population broadly defined beyond race and ethnicity. Now, turning to our roadmap, we have in the introduction to DSM-5 a, uh, a few pages which introduces this topic. And again, uh, these uh, page numbers refer to the DSM-5 text, and they're all in your backup material in your handout. Then in section two, uh, which has the narrative descriptions of the disorders with the diagnostic criteria, there are for some diagnoses, a culture related diagnostic issue section, as well as a gender related diagnostic issue section. So these are 
very good places for information around differential diagnosis at the phenomenological level, what's cultural, what's psychopathological, as well as uh, at the disorder level. For example, the overdiagnosis of uh, schizophrenia in African Americans. I'll show you one example in just a moment. I'll show you an example of, of where diagnostic criteria changed, and then I will spend a moment on other conditions that may be a focus of clinical attention because it does relate very much to the two instruments. Then in section three of DSM-5, there's a section entitled uh, cultural formulation, and there is where we find our two tools. And then finally, in the appendix, there is a glossary of cultural concepts of distress, which replaces the glossary of cultural bound syndromes, which appeared in appendix I of DSM-4. And that term culture bound syndromes no longer exists in DSM-5. So in the introduction, there is this description about uh, culture and how does this affect someone's cultural identity. And the, what you see in the blue there are just fields, uh, fields of uh, information that we wanna tap into to understand cultural identity. And so the bottom line is it's not just one variable like geographic origin or race ethnicity. It's dynamic, not static. It can change over time. It can change as someone migrates from Vietnam to the United States, depending on what age they came and, um, and the possibility of of a changing cultural identity because of that. So that ultimately we do need to understand uh, we are aiming for a person-centered care that takes into account the intersectional, ever-changing uh, cultural identity of our patient. And I'll elaborate on this when I get to that section of the outline. So here's an example of culture-related diagnostic issues section under schizophrenia. I'm only giving you a small portion of this. Uh, what uh, you see here actually existed in DSM-4, acknowledging that uh, we need to pay attention to uh, cultural issues. And then one example is that ideas that appear delusional in one culture may be commonly held in another. You see how that's like a stop sign that says before you assume that such ideas are delusional, consider the possibility of it being related to the patient's culture. And similarly, we see, here's a second example, in some cultures, visual or auditory hallucinations with a religious content, such as hearing God's voice, are a normal part of religious experience. And then this sentence was added to further elaborate on this in DSM-5. So let me um, give you an example here. You ask a patient, well, have you been hearing voices? And the patient says, well, God's voice. So before you go down the, the psychopathology track, meaning, well, God's voice, that means an auditory hallucination. That's a psychotic symptom. That means a diagnosis of psychotic disorder of some kind or mood disorder with psychotic features or um, something, you know, along psychopathology track. Before you go down that track, consider the possibility, this is that uh, ask, don't assume, ask more. Can you tell me more? Then you go through your usual questions. Um, well, uh, when did you, when, where do you hear God's voice? How often? When did this start? And the patient says, well, every Sunday, uh, it's been going on 30 years. My whole family hears it, hears God's voice. In fact, all the people in the congregation does. And so you have the idea that this may be related to the person's religion or the person's culture, but you can't stop there. You need to ask, well, has anything changed? And the patient might say, oh, yes. Well, in the last two weeks, I hear God's voice every day outside of church. And what is God's voice saying? Well, jump off the bridge. Well, that's a little different. And sometimes it is a combination of culture and psychopathology. And that's our job as psychiatrists to go through this process. Here's an example under panic disorder, this little 
section was added, uh, work of Devon Hinton at Harvard, showing that there are some distressing experiences which should not be counted towards the criteria for panic disorder. Now, the V codes are in section two at the back. Here's the introduction to it. As you can see, these are conditions, distressing experiences, problems that may be a focus of clinical attention and may affect the diagnosis, course, prognosis, or treatment of a mental disorder. And therefore, can, they can be coded as part of the diagnosis. But very important to remember that they are not mental disorders, not mental disorders. And that's why they, they are often forgotten because if they're not mental disorders and our job is to treat mental disorders, well, you know, why should we pay attention to these? And uh, by the way, if they're not mental disorders, they're not billable. So, you know, of course we tend to just uh, neglect them. But I'd like to suggest another uh, approach here, which ties in with what I'll be talking about in a moment here. And that is the, there are categories of these uh, V codes. And for each of these categories, there are specific codes that give more details. And I think these uh, V codes uh, relate very much to the social determinants of mental health. If you will, these are the tips of the iceberg, you know, above the waterline that patients complain about. Um, and then what's underneath the waterline are the social determinants of mental health. The next two slides are by Michael Compton and Ruth Shim. They wrote a, uh, they co-edited a very important book of 2015 with that title. And in the ones in yellow here were in that book. Uh, they had 10 and the ones in white, the six in white are new ones that they have added since then. So if you look in the lower left corner, there is adverse early life experiences. And so this has been well documented, you know, going back to, you know, uh, the year 2000 at least. And the one next to it is discrimination and social exclusion. And then looking above that, you see things like homelessness and food insecurity and unemployment, which I dare say many of our patients have experienced during this pandemic year. So these are all social determinants of mental health. And then in the upper right corner is a new one, which is climate change. Now, these are important because as you can see, they moving uh, towards the top, they have adverse health outcomes as the final pathway through the risk factors there. So we have the biomedical determinants of mental health and the psychological determinants of mental health. And yes, we have now documentation of the social determinants of mental health and why we need to pay attention to these. Um, and what's below the social determinants of mental health, those three boxes there are the public policy, social norms, and how that affects the distribution of opportunity, the concept of justice. Um, and these are the underlying structures uh, that affect the social determinants of mental health. And uh, the work of Helena Hansen and, uh, Jonathan, and Jonathan Metzl in enunciating that we need to develop structural competency uh, to address these structural issues that underlie the social determinants of mental health. And I also want to make mention that Vivian Pender, our APA uh, president, has, uh, has announced that uh, social determinants of mental health is her presidential theme. This is going to be a theme of the annual meeting in New Orleans, and she has appointed a 13-person task force to focus on this for this year. Uh, it's led by Dilip Jeste uh, from UC San Diego, a past president of APA, and I uh, found out a few weeks ago that I have also been appointed to this uh, task force. And so this is uh, uh, Compton and Shim's latest uh, rendition of this, where they put the 16 social determinants of mental health into the four pods there. And here's an example of a culturation difficulty, um, as you can see. Um, and also this one, I think, is very relevant to what's been happening in the country that, 
uh, patients may complain about this. Uh, so instead of just ignoring it, you know, saying this is not part of any diagnostic criteria, we need to pay attention because the, this may be distressing a patient. And then this, uh, um, this V code, which I helped to get into the DSM for, for patients having distressing experiences related to uh, losing their faith in God or feeling that God is punishing them for their sins or mystical experiences or near-death experiences that are distressing to them, we should not call them symptoms of a mental disorder. And this is a category uh, for you to consider. Now, moving to our first tool, the outline for cultural formulation. This first appeared in Appendix I, the ninth appendix of DSM-4, and that's why it tends to be forgotten. Um, and uh, it has five parts. The first part, four parts are interrelated fields of information that we ask the, the clinician to know about. And so this involves cultural identity, cultural concepts of distress, cultural stressors and supports, the cultural features of the relationship between the individual and the clinician. You see how that ties into that accreditation standard. And then the fifth part is asking us to summarize the information obtained and how does it affect our differential diagnosis and our treatment plan. So that's like the call to action uh, and this is a step that um, really needs to happen uh, in order to put into practice the information you've obtained. Now, the Cultural Issues Work Group of DSM-5, headed by Roberto Luis Fernandez, and I was part of that 30-person work group, um, thought it would be important to provide the clinicians uh, the um, questions to help them gather the information for the outline for cultural formulation. And so uh, there are 16 questions in these broad areas here. And um, uh, you have the patient version and the informant version, which are printed in section three of DSM-5. And then we have the 12 supplementary modules, which are not in the DSM-5. They are in your handout packet that was distributed. And you would access them online by Googling supplementary modules DSM-5. So these are lists of additional questions for deeper dives on particular topics in the outline for cultural formulation. So for example, uh, there are only three questions on cultural identity in the core CFI. And if you wanna learn more about cultural identity of the patient, well, here's a supplementary module to help guide you in that inquiry. And so these are different parts of the outline. And then the last four relate to specific patient populations. Um, so if you're seeing any of these patients and you wanna learn more about their cultural issues, here you have the supplementary module. So this is what it looks like in the DSM-5, the core CFI. And as you can see, it's not just simply a list of 16 questions, but there's a guide to the interviewer and specific instructions. And you can see the first question in the center there is what brings you here today? So hopefully you're asking that one right now and you're already doing one of 16 questions. Um, and now I'm gonna go through the 16 questions and relate them to the outline for cultural formulation. They're not in the same order because uh, we thought that uh, what brings you here today would be a natural place to start rather than uh, uh, what is most important about your background or identity. So um, wherever you see problem in caps and brackets, uh, that means we'd like you to use the patient's words. So what brings you here today? Wind illness. Sometimes people have uh, different ways of describing their problem to their social network. How would you describe your wind illness to them? And what troubles you most about your wind illness? 
And then, so, uh, so the first question I think is the most important. Uh, and then this fourth question is also one of the more important ones. Why do you think this is happening to you? And what do you think are the causes of your wind illness? So, and then what do others in your social network say are the causes of your wind illness? So this relates to part B, and this is uh, all in your handout packet. Um, as you can see, there are three subtypes of cultural concepts of distress, and these are all defined on page 14 in the introduction to DSM-5. You'll see definitions of these three. Idioms of distress are like the presenting complaints, uh, the chief complaints, and cultural syndromes are a clustering of these idioms of distress with, with the perceived cause and explanatory models of the cause. Then there's a further elaboration on this, uh, asking us to compare whatever the patient says with the social network, the social, the, the cultural norms of the cultural reference group. That's why we have questions two and five to ask us about the social networks sense of things. And then we have assessment of the coping and help seeking patterns, including professional, traditional alternative or complementary sources of care. Now the uh, CFI questions that relate to this section come a little later, 11 to 15. Um, and so we're interested here, not only in the visits to doctors and healthcare providers, but also Tai Chi and acupuncture and herbal medicine and religious and spiritual healers to name some others. And in the uh, glossary, there's in the appendix, I mentioned this glossary, which has nine examples. Um, and there are more than nine, but there are just nine in this uh, glossary. And so, We have here a table, uh, far left column are the actual names. So when you ask, you know, what brings you here today? Nervios, okay. Well, uh, and then there's a, uh, which of the three subtypes here? And some of these are related. So nervios is an idiom of distress, as you can see, but it is also part of the atake de nervios, part of that cultural syndrome. And the far right column are places in the world where we uh, see this. And of course, patients come from all over to the US, so we are interested in this. And this is the cautionary tale when we don't pay attention to this. Um, this is a book based on a true life story of a Hmong uh, infant, Hmong being a ethnic group from Laos, who had a grand mal seizure disorder treated by a pediatrician and a neurologist. They had a purely biomedical causal model and therefore a purely biomedical treatment plan of medications. However, the family had a, uh, a different, um, uh, different uh, cultural concept of distress. They called it, the spirit catches you and you fall down. And they had a supernatural cause for why this was happening. And they had uh, kind of shamanic treatments were their way of approaching this uh, distressing experience. And unfortunately, there was never a negotiation discussion of these different conceptual cultural concepts of distress, different, different uh, causes, different treatment plan, different treatment modalities. And this led to non-compliance with the medication. And that led to a prolonged grand mal seizure and the patient was left in a vegetative state before dying about uh, 12 years later. It was reported in the New York Times. So the next two CFI questions relate to stresses and supports. Are there any kinds of support that make your wind illness better? And are there any kinds of stresses that make your wind illness worse? So that's the key term, stressors and supports, stressors and supports. So this relates to part C of the outline. And the, what's in yellow are the key takeaway terms here. Identify the key stressors and supports in the social environment, which can be both 
local and distant events uh, and the three domains of religion, family, and other social networks. Now, religion and family was in DSM-4, other social networks was added. And then we have this uh, sentence, this uh, section, which further elaborates on this concept. So let me amplify this just a little bit. When we talk about you know, local, local stressors and supports, of course, we need to look at the interpersonal relationships um, across the three domains, uh, local in the sense of uh, local, uh, geographically local to us are interpersonal relationships across those three domains. But we also need to look at the social determinants of mental health, which can be local by geography or time, as well as distant by geography or time. So what do I mean by that? Well, like climate change, that's a social determinant of mental health we saw on the chart. And that's certainly local in the sense that, you know, a, a wildfire or a rain or a hurricane, you know, is affecting us like right now, but it's also a distant in terms of geography because climate change affects the whole world. And, um, you know, AAPI hate uh, that's been going on in the past year, increasingly so, um, is certainly local now, you know, related to the pandemic and the political climate um, but it is also distant in time because this goes back, you know, hundreds of years in America, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and also slavery is another example of something that's distant in time, and yet it still affects us now. And then when we speak about supports in a book uh, that I'll, I'll reference in just a moment uh, by Pamela Hayes, she talks about these supports these strengths or supports that we could access. So the idea here again is put on the cultural lens uh, and see what else you can see in terms of how we can support our patients. And, um, and so uh, uh, here you can see uh, extended families or religious communities, uh, further down involvement in a political or social action group may be particularly important to the patient that you're seeing. And then here we have things like caring for animals. We know that there are certain patients where that's very important to them, as well as uh, these other activities. And then we speak about the religion, spiritual, and moral traditions. There is a whole supplementary module which helps you assess all of this in patients that I would uh, point to these are the categories where these are discussed and then family um, starting with a genogram would be very helpful knowing the nuclear family and the extended family and the relationship to acculturation and a family therapy so this book at the bottom here has 52 chapters not only on Japanese families and Vietnamese families but also Irish families and Italian families and Russian families, amongst others. Right, so here's a list of the books that I have been talking about. So questions 8 to 10 uh, focus on cultural identity. So we have this lead up here that helps uh, explain this issue with the patient. And then you ask for you, what are the most important aspects of your background or identity? And then nine, um, are there any aspects of your background identity that makes a difference to your wind illness? So how do you relate your identity to your wind, to your problem that you're experiencing? And then number 10 is kind of a second pass question to see if there's anything else that may be of concern to you around your background or identity. So this all relates to part A, um, and this is what was in DSM-4. And as you can see, there was a mention of race, ethnicity, and biculturality and language. Now, added in DSM-5 uh, is this very important sentence, which explicitly acknowledges other cultural identity variables, as you can see. But it is not a complete list, um, uh, because... Uh, let me now show you two schemas or um, to help uh, help you with this is the uh, work of Pamela Hayes in her book where she uses the word addressing 
as an acronym uh, for, so each of these letters uh, brings forward a particular cultural identity category for us to think about, to assess in our patient. But again, this is not a complete list because there's no L in addressing, and yet L language is very important. And here's another diagram that uh, illustrates this. It comes from thinkculturalhealth.hhs.gov, where there's a great uh, e-learning program for behavioral health professionals that I referenced at the very end of my talk. Yeah, as you can see, starting at uh, eight o'clock is linguistic characteristics, and then fanning across to 12 o'clock and five o'clock. These are the different cultural identity variables that uh, a patient may, may, be, may have, may be particularly salient for the patient, um, and how this intersects in this diagram with that six o'clock health beliefs and practices, that's part B, and the environment at seven o'clock is part C. So the quality of intersectionality uh, is, is so critically important uh, here. And so again, it's ask, don't assume, you see, because there are many different sub-ethnic groups under Asian, national origin doesn't define a homogeneous ethnic group. And ultimately we do need to ask the patient because we need to know the patient's assessment of this um, because uh, you know, we, don't, we don't really know what is most important to them. And so understanding cultural identity is like critical because it affects all the other parts of the outline for cultural formulation. And it does have, it can uh, be a support or a stress for the patient. Uh, so for example, at the intrapsychic level, there could be cultural identity conflict, you know, uh, for, so for a Vietnamese uh, person who was born in America, but parents are traditional Vietnamese parents that immigrated here, they may be struggling with to what extent am I a traditional Vietnamese person or am I a uh, mainstream American person? Uh, then for, you know, uh, some people may question, am I gay? Am I straight? And for religious identity, someone might be brought up very devoutly religious, but are drifting away now in, in adulthood, and they may have conflicts about that. And then at the interpersonal level, you know, take that uh, Vietnamese adolescent who is uh, born here in this country and hardly speaks any Vietnamese, uh, even though they share the same ethnicity with their parents, with his parents uh, who immigrated here and they speak limited English, uh, even though they share the same ethnicity, they have different cultural identities and different values. And therefore there can be interpersonal relationship conflicts because of that. And then at the social level, of course, cultural identity is very important. Now, questions 11 to 15 uh, relate to self-coping and past help-seeking, and then barriers to care, which is very important because barriers that patients have had in the past may affect barriers now, which you'll need to understand and address in order to uh, optimize uh, them coming back. Now, 14 and 15 are really, really important because they're like bottom line questions. What kinds of help do you think would be most useful to you at this time for your wind illness? And are there any other kinds of help that your social network would have suggested? So this relates back to part B. I mentioned we'd come back to this. And again, patients may... Uh, just pop into the psychiatric emergency service for the very first time, or maybe they went to primary care first with tremendous somatic complaints and negative medical workups, and then they come to mental health. Or maybe they saw their indigenous healers or they, you know, acupuncture, herbal medicine, whatever, or religious healer. So there are many pathways to getting to mental health. And we do, we just need to understand and recognize them. And uh, so these are just pictures and lists of these sorts of things.
Now, moving on to the very last question of the CFI, it just touches, it just touches on the clinician patient relationship. And this is a very important question. Uh, sometimes doctors and patients misunderstand each other because they come from different backgrounds or have different expectations. Have you been concerned about this? And is there anything that we can do to provide you with the care that you need? So all of this is just uh, scratching the surface on the cultural features of the relationship between the individual and the clinician. What's in yellow was added in DSM-5. And so it asks us to identify differences in the cultural identity between the clinician and the patient. And language and difficulties in communication were added here for obvious reasons. Now, this sentence at the bottom was added that's so important. Experiences of racism and discrimination in the larger society may impede establishing trust in the relationship. So, you know, depending on uh, the match between clinician and patient, uh, there may be uh, there may be a lack of trust, uh, and we should not necessarily attribute that to psychopathology right off the bat. Uh, uh, you know, pa patients paranoid or treatment resistant or um, uh, suspicious. Um, we we need to understand you know, this possibility here. Um, and, um, and ultimately, uh, it, this can lead to uh, difficulty establishing, maintaining a treatment al alliance, which gets back to the training accreditation standards. We know how very important this is for assessment and treatment. So how do you do this? How do you operationalize this? Let me give you four steps and four quick examples. The first step, the bedrock of the path, is to understand the clinician's own cultural identity through self-reflection. Secondly, is to compare the cultural identity of the patient with that of the clinician. So how do you do that? Well, have a little table. So in the far left, you put the cultural identity variables like age, gender, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, uh, religious uh, orientation, and so on. So, yeah. And then in the middle column, you put the patient's cultural identity variables. And then the far right column, you put the clinician's cultural identity variables. And you look for similarities and differences and see what effect this has on on the relationship. And one possibility, of course, is the issue of bias, as I mentioned earlier. And this can go both ways. There could be biases that the clinicians have of the patients, and also the patient may have certain biases against the clinician. And then the last step is to, uh, no, the third step is to see how these similarities and differences affect the elements of the relationship. And again, these are factors that we are concerned about every day with every relationship we have with patients. Um, and the idea is put on the cultural lens to see how the cultural elements can affect all of these different uh, aspects. And then the last step, the fourth step is what would help the clinician to provide optimal care? That's a bottom line question that you have to get to. And sometimes cultural identity matches are very important. And I'll give you two examples in a moment. And then other times it is increased knowledge and skills concerning these areas. And you would obtain that, for example, by getting a cultural consultation from a culture broker or a faith leader in the community or maybe another clinician in the department who knows about those particular cultural issues uh, or PubMed searches or books. <clears throat> so now let me give you four <clears throat> quick examples. I'm Chinese, I only speak English and a Chinese patient comes up to me and starts speaking Cantonese. Well, we have a language uh, cultural identity difference, and this is going to cause problems in communication. So I need to respond by getting a trained interpreter or referring the person to a uh, 
Cantonese speaking uh, psychiatrist optimally or working through a Cantonese speaking clinician. Second example, I'm a man and a patient is a woman. And on the first interview, there seems to be reluctance to uh, discuss symptoms. Um, and at the end of the interview, the patient says, well, you know, I'd really feel more comfortable in speaking with a woman psychiatrist. So what do I do with that? Do I say, oh, patient's treatment resistant, passive aggressive, you know, move down that psychopathology track, or do I ask, don't assume, well, can you tell me more? And eventually the patient says, I don't want to get into it. I just, it's just difficult to discuss it with you. And, and we later find out that the patient has a, had a very uh, physical sexual assault history with her husband. And so that's experiences that she's had with men, you know, causes her to have distrust with me as a male psychiatrist. So that's where another cultural identity match might be particularly important. Third example, I'm a Biden Democrat and a man walks in with a red cap that says, make America great again. And he looks at me and says, well, what country are you from? So here we have a political orientation difference and immediately it's evoking a, uh, a bias on the part of the patient in terms of, you know, who, what, you know, where am I from and what are my qualifications and all of that. So it's immediately affecting our relationship. So uh, this perspective helps us to uh, understand what's going on. The last example is I'm an atheist and I ask my patient, well, what brings you here today? Well, uh, I've lost my faith in God and God is punishing me for my sins. So again, what am I supposed to do with that? You know, since I don't believe in God uh, and I don't believe this discussion has anything to do with psychiatry, I'm just going to stay silent. Um, or I could inadvertently start psychopathologizing this. Well, why is God so important to you? What's, you know... Or could I see this as a religious or spiritual problem potentially, or an ask, don't assume. That's the point. And I, so I have to look at my transference, counter-transference issues, and so on. Now, moving on here, of course, I've just been talking about the cultural features of the relationship between the patient and the clinicians, but we also need to keep this in mind in terms of other relationships. Now, moving on to the last part of the outline, it asks us to summarize the information and how does this affect our diagnosis for mental disorders and other clinically relevant issues or problems. And I do believe that's the V codes. And how does this then affect our treatment plan? So we always want to make an accurate diagnosis. And that starts with a complete differential diagnosis because we want to avoid misdiagnosis, which can lead to mistreatment. And we've given, I've given a number of examples here today about where that might happen and how uh, using the outline can help us gather the information. So concretely, what can you do? So one thing I would really recommend is, you know, for any disorder that you're considering for the patient, like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, that you look at the culture-related and gender-related diagnostic issue sections, because it will give you these uh, tips on, uh, you know, what's culture, what's psychopathology, and also the prevalence and the course and the outcome, which can all vary by culture and gender. And these are all going to be updated in the DSM-5 text revision. Secondly, is to review and add the V codes that map onto these social determinants of mental health so they can be addressed in the treatment plan. In terms of treatment planning, the process of negotiating and managing a treatment plan to maximize adherence and compliance, put on the cultural lens, see how that might help you around the question about taking medications. Are there any cultural reasons why the patients might not be taking medications along the lines of stigma or different explanatory models? And then in terms of the content issues, 
As we know, the pharmacodynamics and kinetics of medications can vary by genetics involving race, ethnicity, but also gender, age, environment, and so on. So we need to keep that in, in mind. Uh, and then in terms of psychotherapy, respecting patient and family expectations, my deceased colleague in Asian mental health, Evelyn Lee, used to say when treating traditionally acculturated uh, Chinese patients, be the tiger bomb oil at the first interview, because those patients expect some kind of small relief in the first interview. And as we think about our forms of treatment, some Patients do require family assessment because they see themselves as part of a family um, and not less so as an individual. Uh, and then even in our usual forms of psychotherapy, uh, there are now uh, cultural modifications that people have written about uh, in books and articles that need to be incorporated and uh, ask these questions about what therapist characteristics would facilitate or hinder treatment. Sociocultural approaches, family, so, uh, spirituality, religion, social networks, and addressing the social determinants of mental health through structural competency. Uh, books that are very helpful. This is the best book on the outline for cultural formulation. Uh, then we have the best book on the CFI. Uh, this is an online training from Columbia, uh, Roberto's uh, um, shop, uh, that's really an excellent training on the uh, CFI that I highly recommend. Uh, this is also another uh, uh, e-learning program on cultural competence for behavioral health professionals. And there is a professional society, this uh, Sakai Society for the Study of Psychiatry and Culture. You can learn about it at this website. We have an annual meeting, webinars uh, that to learn about this. So we now have about five minutes or so for Q and A. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Uh, very helpful to walk through the, the points of that uh, interview, associated references, and all the all the supporting information. Uh, as Dr. Liu mentioned, now is an opportunity for, for comments and questions. If any participants have a, a question, uh, please type it in to the chat and we can, we can um, go through those now. I want to make mention that in the uh, one of the documents that have been distributed, the DEIA resource list, at the very back of that are a list of uh, links to Amazon book lists, which I have created on cultural psychiatry. Uh, so the first list, for example, are the top 40 books in cultural psychiatry, um, including many of the ones that I've made mention in my talk. So that's an easy way of learning more about other uh, books. Yeah. As, as we're waiting to see if any questions, uh, additional questions come in. Oh, here's one. Uh, uh, can we get late? Yes, uh, there are links that were sent out um, in, in the announcement that uh, went out yesterday. Um, uh, there are attachments in there with links associated in one of the embedded files. Um, uh, one question about the pra practical use of the CFI. Uh, do, how might one, uh, let's say during a consultation in a hospital setting, for example, what might one uh, sort of incorporate that into initial consultation? Might that be part of follow-up visit? Uh, might it be at both times, different components of it? What, do, what might the practice of it look like? Right. I, I think it is, uh, obviously there are time constraints. Uh, you know, I think the top questions to ask if you had to streamline things would be one, uh, you know, what brings you here today? What are the causes, the stresses and supports questions? That's number six and seven. Number eight is uh, your background or identity. Um, and then uh, 14, what kinds of help do you think might be helpful? And then number 16, about the, the clinician-patient relationship. I think those are the highest priority, I would say. Uh, you may have to ask these questions over time. You, you may not have enough time in the first meeting. Um, and um, 
but I think it's just very important to know what this instrument is so you can pick and choose, uh, you know, what is relevant. Now, some questions that have come in, the first is uh, issues of working with children and adolescents. And yes, so you should look at that supplementary module on children and adolescents. And in the CFI handbook, the second reference at the end of my talk, uh, there's a whole chapter on, on CFI. Now also, uh, and also there's a new book that just came out uh, by Appy Press on uh, cultural issues in working with children and adolescents and their families. It just came out in December, I believe, and edited by uh, Rana Parekh. Um, so I highly recommend that book. Um, and I see Pamela has a question, um, a comment, a um, patient guide to the central issues. Uh, also, one need not wait for someone culturally different to apply these approaches. That's right, because cultural identity, as I've, as I've discussed it, is intersectional and there are many, many variables. I mean, you may share the same uh, you know, uh, ethnicity, uh, but you may have very different political orientations as I've illustrated and who knows what's gonna happen you know, there. Um, um, next question, uh, would you consider conditions that occur more frequently or disproportionately among white Americans a form of disparity in health status? For example, the fatal outcome in our field is suicide. White Americans, especially white men, are dramatically right. Right. That needs to be looked at. Um, and Jonathan Metzl wrote a book a few years ago entitled Dying of Whiteness, uh, where he talks about uh, the, uh, the, where he studies basically uh, 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 Trump supporters and how uh, they, are, they are Trump supporters, even though uh, his policies uh, really are detrimental to their health. Uh, just as an example. And of, yes, of course, yes, wherever disparities occur, we need to look at them and understand them and respond to them. And, and again, we may need to design approaches that speak to their particular issues. Well, Dr. Luther, thank you for going through the questions uh, as they came in. And we're just at, we're a minute or two past 1 p.m. And I, I wanna thank you again for presenting today in, in our Grand Rounds uh, series for going through this, fielding questions. Um, and due to time, uh, we'll have to, I'll have to leave it at that for today, but thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. Bye-bye.